Hello all, Rick here about to talk at length on a subject that I realise is complete fiction and what's more, lore and speculation on the mythology of that fiction, but you know what, it's my channel and Klingons are fun. <laughs> it is established that the Klingon people once had deities that they worshipped, but they are long gone. Of course, every Klingon knows of Kalis the Unforgettable the warrior philosopher who shaped much of Klingon culture into their spacefaring age. However, he is not a god, but a mortal with traceable historical context who has faded into legend and mythology. It was his teachings on warfare and general Klingon life that cemented his legacy. However, even he was aware of the gods of Klingon myth and even became involved in these supernatural elements concerning the afterlife, delving into Grethor to retrieve the soul of his father. The existence of the Klingon Hell and Heaven suggests that they too were inhabited by more than the souls of Klingons, and in fact this is certainly the case with the Feklar, the Klingon demon that presides over their dishonoured Hell. Klingon myth even includes a creation story that predates all recorded history, and certainly the time of Kalis. In fact, it is a tale that is told even during matrimonial ceremonies by Klingon clerics, so let's start by looking at this. The story, as told in ceremony, is that of the celebration of the Klingon heart. The first Klingon was forged by the gods his heart made from fire and steel, and it was wild and passionate, but soon grew lonely. The gods exclaimed that they had created the strongest heart in all the heavens, none can stand before it without trembling at its strength. The gods, seeing the diminishing of their creation, decried his loneliness, so forged a second soul for him, a companion, the second Klingon and his mate. The second Klingon was as strong as the first, also gifted with more wisdom than Quartar, and after a brief skirmish they united. However, together their flames burned bright enough so that in time they turned on their creators and destroyed the gods, reducing their heaven to ash. As Worf says, the gods were more trouble than they were worth, which has a lot of interesting connotations. For his part in the betrayal, Kortar was banished to the land of the dead to forever take the helm of the barge of the dead and ferry dishonoured Klingon souls to Grethor, his eternal task, a punishment. In a deleted scene from Barge of the Dead, Balana Torres talks about the tale as she understood it. She describes that Kortar loved a warrior called Shelka, and that these were the first Klingons. It was united in their love, that they were able to turn on the very gods that created them and overthrew them, slaying them outright, but setting in motion a curse that would forever part them. While Kortar's punishment was revealed in the shows, his mates remained elusive, but according to Torres, Shelka was said to be cursed with eternal life, so that she may never find death and forever the two would remain parted. We also have mention of the Klingon source of creation, the realm of Kurtu, and it was from this wellspring that all was birthed, which was one of Cybok's alleged finds at the heart of the galaxy. So according to Klingon religion, Stovokor, the realm of heavens, and Grethor lasted beyond the death of the Klingon gods, so from all of this we have scant few facts on the actual deities. So, all that is canon. We know that the Klingon religion was a polytheistic one, that their gods created everything from a realm called Kultu, and that their death at the hands of Kortar and his wife did not bring down the Klingon afterlife, suggesting that the systems they had set up outlasted them. Kalis later steps into the picture and is venerated, but does not take the place of any deity while Grethor is ruled over by a being that predates Kalis, the Fekla, and his hordes of demon Fekhiri. As Stovacor still exists, we can assume that the heaven they reduced to ashes 
was either Kultui or some other realm that the Pantheon called home. Turning to beta contents now, we have a few more details, such as the names of several of these gods, Wa Joa, Kartila, and Tukmor, as well as some more details on the Purge and Klingon religions before Kalis. From the book titled The Klingon Art of War, we have a brief passage or two on the deities of ancient Klingons. This mentions that all this took place millennia before Kalis, and that the Pantheon resided atop the Great World Tree, Ku Sor, on the plains of Balduk. This might reside in the realm of creation, but they could leave the tree to walk among the primitive Klingon people, which they did often, requiring sacrifice, tribute, and ritual, all of which the Klingons provided. One day, the first god, Waja'oa destroyed a small village and told the surviving Klingons that he would rebuild it better than before if they sacrificed ten creatures and burned them for him. This they did, although two hunters died in acquiring their prey. In return, Wajoa resurrected the fallen hunters and built for the Klingons mortar and brick houses, sparking an advancement in their technology. In return for these gifts, the Klingons venerated Wajoa, and soon he was joined by more of his pantheon. Over time, however, the demands from the gods increased and the rewards grew less, while other gods began to covet the worship of their kin, soon claiming territory, societies and followers for themselves and pitting them against one another in wars of faith. The Klingons soon became less and less interested in worshipping these gods that in their eyes were acting no better than themselves, and soon Kortar and his mate recruited warriors from across the lands to march on Balduk, where they climbed the great tree, slew the gods in battle, and then set it ablaze. Kartila is said to be the only deity to survive the purge of the heavens, and represented the concept of destiny and inevitability. Her appearance is that of an armoured Klingon holding a jatak, a bladed cudgel over her heart, and an old cup that when drunk from was either containing poison or water. The second goddess's name was Tukmor, however her name is now used as a curse word and is little more understood than that. This adds some more context to the Klingon pantheon. Firstly, the fact that the home of the gods seems to be atop a world tree akin to Norse mythology, one of the later Klingon inspirations, and that although Kortar and Selka were the first two Klingons, there were many others before the fall of the gods. This means that either the gods created Kortar and Shelka to have very long lifespans, or that the Klingon species expanded very rapidly within one lifetime. Of course, it's all myth anyway, but there is another possibility, that the Klingon gods are just one of many alien influences their culture suffered in its past. It would not be the first time that the Klingon world of Kronos was targeted by some species seeking to exploit the natives. The Herk are the most known outsiders to invade, and this was in the time of Kalis, with their defeat seemingly heralding the emergence of Klingons into the interstellar scene. Additionally, we have non-canonical stories that mention the Fek'hiri as genetically augmented Klingons, which were created to fight for the Dominion before the Jem'Hadar existed, pre kalis However, they were created and named based on pre-existing Klingon myths. And recently we've got the non-canonical inclusion of the engineers of Sakadesh, which were a godlike species that reside close to Klingon space, and a species that has long been at peace with the Empire, something that the notorious Conquer Hungry Empire sees as a mark of shame, and a species that has been kept secret since the time of Kalis. And of course, there is always the origin of the ancient humanoid species from the chase that revealed a semi-shared ancestor of most humanoid life that clearly predates and precludes the Klingon creation myth. Perhaps these ancient humanoids came back to check on their creations, and some grew a little power hungry at being regarded as deities until the Klingons overthrew them. But all in all mythology does not have to line up with what really happened, 
doubly so for mythology within fiction, but I still find it fun to talk about and enjoy ancient legends regardless of their origin. Klingon myth sounds like a great time to be honest, and the line from Worf has always stuck in my mind for several reasons. One of which I have explored here, the extensive history and speculation it encourages. The other reason is because I find it relatable and funny, but also very suitable for the Klingons. The very fact that their lore tells them that even their gods could not stand up to the Klingons' martial prowess and passion tells us so much about how they view themselves. Warfare and honour are integral to their culture, and even the notion that they would bend the knee to anyone, even some mythological creator, is absurd to them. The casual remark also makes it seem as if most of their old gods are irrelevant and forgotten, while the Empire chooses to venerate one of their own, a very proficient but mortal individual, Kalis, in place of any superior being. It says much too that while they did away with their gods, they retained their mythology of demons and the Feklar, an unequivocal enemy figure for them to battle. Finally, the additional apocrypha creates the notion of the Klingons splitting into religious wars for a time, each following a different deity and may very well just be metaphorical interpretations of various ancient beliefs coming into conflict until all were wiped away by progress and the emergence of a more global Kronos. Thanks for watching this video on the Klingon gods. I've been Rick and I hope this was fun. Until the next video, thanks again and kapla!